Let's turn now to Romans chapter 9 and verse 17. The scripture says to Pharaoh, For this very purpose I raised you up to demonstrate my power in you, and that my name might be proclaimed throughout the whole earth. So then he has mercy on whom he desires, and he hardens whom he desires. We continue on the theme of the sovereignty of God over his creation. In the time of Moses, there was a Pharaoh who hated the Israelites, and who persecuted them and enslaved them and made life very difficult for them. He was one of God's creation, Pharaoh. There was also a Moses, who was God's creation. And the interesting thing is, God used both of them to demonstrate his power. And God used both of them to proclaim his name throughout the whole earth. Everybody knows about Moses, and everybody knows what happened to Pharaoh. In that time, and even today, after more than 3,000 years. The point here is this. Moses responded to God's call. Pharaoh rebelled against God's call. But it doesn't make a difference to God whether you respond or rebel. God will still accomplish his purpose to glorify his name through the one who responds and through the one who rebels. When we read a verse like we read in Romans 9.17, for this very purpose I raised you up, to demonstrate my power in you, that my name might be proclaimed throughout the whole earth. One would think that God is speaking to one of his servants, that God raised up such a servant, just like he told Jeremiah, I chose you from the mother's womb, and God raised up a servant to demonstrate his power through that servant, and to proclaim the name of the Lord throughout the whole earth. But the interesting thing here is that it is spoken to Pharaoh, the one who constantly rebelled against God and disobeyed him in spite of all the plagues that he saw. What did God finally do? He destroyed Pharaoh's power, delivered the Israelites and buried the Egyptian army under the Red Sea. And through that action, God demonstrated his mighty power throughout the whole world. And the name of the God of Israel began to be feared and revered at that time throughout the whole earth. We read that when the Israelites went into the wilderness at different places, their enemies would say, we have heard about this God who buried the Egyptian army under the Red Sea. So we see that here we see a demonstration of the fact that even somebody like Pharaoh who was the leader of the world's greatest superpower at that time. We, read of, we hear of superpowers these days. There was only one superpower in the world in the days of, that we read of in Exodus, and that was Egypt. And Pharaoh was the ruler of the one superpower in the world. And Pharaoh was destroyed by God. So this is a great comfort for us. You know, Christians face a lot of persecution and, and Paul was writing to these Romans, these Roman Christians were facing a lot of persecution. The emperor in Rome was Nero at that time and he troubled the Christians tremendously. And Paul is comforting these people saying, don't worry about Nero, don't worry about anybody in the world. Think back to Pharaoh who was more powerful than Nero. And God said about him, that God could use him to demonstrate his power, to break his power, and thereby demonstrate God's power over Pharaoh. So, Pharaoh's heart was hardened, it says, in the Old Testament, in the book of Exodus, a number of times. And we can wonder, does God harden people's hearts? It says in Romans 9.18, So then God has mercy on whom he desires, and he hardens those whom he desires. What does that mean? If God hardens a man to go to hell, how can you blame him for going to hell? But that's not exactly the meaning. It's very difficult for us to explain this with our human logic and understanding and reasoning. As I said earlier, our mind is only a 
like the size of a cup compared to the ocean of God's wisdom. But we could explain it like this. The, si the same sun that shines upon the butter that's kept out into the open and melts it. The same sun hardens the clay that's kept out in the sun and makes it into hard bricks. Do you see that? You keep butter out in the open sun in a hot day, it melts and runs as liquid. And you keep clay out in the same sun next to the butter and the clay becomes hard. We could say, God melted the butter. We could say, God hardened the clay. That's right. It God's son, S-U-N, that melted the butter and hardened the clay. But, it's also true that it depended on the type of material that exposed itself to the sun. So, if our heart is like butter, we can say God melts it. If our heart is like clay, God hardens it. But that's not because God is partial. It's because of the way we respond to the gospel message. What is it that hardens that clay? Isn't it the sun? We can say the sun hardened the clay and made it into brick. What is it that melts the butter? We can say the sun melted the butter. It's in exactly the same way it says here, God hardens, hardened Pharaoh's heart. It's not because God decided even before Pharaoh was born that he was to go to hell. Anybody can repent. We read in the Old Testament of that great man, Nebuchadnezzar, the leader of another superpower in the world called Babylon. And you read about his repentance in Daniel chapter 4, how he humbled himself and repented before God. Very unusual, very different from Pharaoh's reaction. So, the sovereignty of God is not something that is absolute in the sense that it predetermines anybody to go to heaven or to hell or to be a child of God or not. But yet, all that I have said so far does not cover the whole subject. It's only as much as your cup and my cup, our mind can understand. There is a whole ocean of truth in this area of God's sovereignty that we will never understand till we get into eternity. But if we can recognize one thing, and that is this, and this is the most important point that you need to understand. My dear friend, if, you, if your heart is not hardened today, don't take the credit for it. It's God's mercy that has softened you. And that's the important thing. Don't ever take the credit for your salvation. This wonderful salvation that we've considered in chapter 3 to chapter 8 of Romans. In Romans chapter 9, what Paul is trying to say is you cannot take the credit for it at all. It's 100% God's work and let's give the glory completely to God for this salvation. That is the theme of Romans chapter 9. God's sovereign choice of us and God determining that we are to be his children. Whether I can explain it or not, I say God chose me. I'm chosen by God before the foundation of the world. I was chosen because of nothing good in me. It was God's choice. It's God who gave me repentance. It's God who gave me the desire to live for Him. It's God who gave me the longing to turn from sin and to receive Christ. It's God who opened my eyes to see that Christ died on the cross for my sins. God's willing to do that for you as you hear this gospel. If you hear it right now, God desires that you should be saved. And you can be part of God's eternal choice too. See, the other question people can ask is this. Romans chapter 9 and verse 19. You will say to me then, why does he still find fault? For who resists his will? You see, this is the other question that human logic can ask. <clears throat> and it's only a proud man who can ask such a question. Who can resist God's will? Why does God still find fault with me for sinning if it's his choice? What's the answer to that? Paul doesn't go into a reasoned explanation. He doesn't even try to explain it the way I try to explain it. No. The answer to all such questions is simply this. Who are you, O man, Romans 9.20, to answer back to God? 
the thing that is molded cannot say to the molder, Why did you make me like this, will it? What a humbling answer. You see, man is so proud that he expects to be given a reasonable answer. And though I, as a human being, may have given you a sort of a reasonable answer, as far as God is concerned, I just want to assure you that God doesn't want to give us reasonable answers. He wants us to trust Him with our hearts, even in the areas where we cannot explain His sovereign choice. The only thing He says is, O oh man, who are you? to answer back to God like that. We have no right to question God's sovereign choice. Doesn't the potter, verse 21, have a right over the clay to make the same lump, one vessel, and for honorable use, another for common use? You go into a potter's house and you find that a potter uses the clay to make all types of vessels. Some vessels are so expensive because he's put in a lot of labor on them and some of them are so cheap. Very cheap, just to contain water. So, can you go into the potter's house and say, why are you doing it like this? It's his clay. In the same way, we, we must recognize the world is God's. He's got every right to do what he likes with it. We cannot question God. This is another great truth that comes through in Romans chapter 9. Don't question God's dealings. Just humble yourself. You know, that can solve many of our problems. If only we will accept the sovereignty of God, many, many problems in our life can be solved. We will continue our study next week.